I'm not doing it. You can't fucking make me. Salutation Cinemaskis, I'm Dr. Sammy101 and welcome back to our month with the Asylum. Quick recap, can, can, some, can someone remind me why the fuck I'm doing this again? For those of you who started watching this year or didn't know, I've turned November into a themed month where we look at the filmography of the mockbuster factory that is the Asylum. And if you don't know who they are, they're the company who keeps supplying sci-fi with those crappy movies you hear about, you know. Sharknado, that sort of thing. And this year, we're starting things off with perhaps their most blatant ripoff. Sorry, <laughs> not ripoff, I mean mockbuster. Atlantic Rim. This, this has to be a winner, right? I mean, this is what Asylum is good for, yes? I mean, it's a movie that really needs no real plot and has a bunch of fake as fuck CGI robots kicking the snot out of a bunch of fake as fuck CGI monsters. I mean, this has to be a win, yes? This was not a win. This was not a win. Oh god, this was not a win. Alright, first of all, I just need to make sure everyone knows the premise of Pacific Rim, yes? Giant alien creatures start coming to Earth through a dimensional fissure in the Pacific Ocean, and how the entire movie takes place like years after that, like decades into a conflict between us and them. Well, to get the decades-old conflict, the Godzilla-esque monsters, the awesome Gundam mechs, and a tense, well-written narrative of three-dimensional characters, because this is the Asylum, and now it's almost discount Power Rangers. I say it's almost Power Rangers, because Power Rangers was fun! I mean, I know Power Rangers had the budget of a plastic spoon, but this movie puts Power Rangers to shame with how cheap it is. They create these giant CGI effects and then show them off for half second bursts before cutting to the view from inside the cockpits or the human bean counters that are in location miles away from the action, meaning we spend our time watching these pointless fucks more than end up watching the fights we came and paid money to see. But the biggest flaw that this movie falls prey to is the trap that is every Asylum movie almost. Setup. This film focuses on the first incidents of these monsters attacking, and it's so dull. You know the reason Pacific Rim worked so well? Because it got all of its setup out of the way in a five minute burst. Nobody wants a rehash of Godzilla 1998. We didn't want that the first time around, why did Asylum think we'd like it a second time but with a thin veneer of discount Pacific Rim on top? So after that stellar opening, uh, what's the actual story of this movie? Do you even care? You are aware I described this movie as a cheaper version of Power Rangers and a discount Godzilla 1998, yes? You're aware that's not a good combination, right? Fuck. I I'm gonna give you the option of watching some a review I actually enjoy- You know what, I'm gonna put it in a card. I'm gonna put it in a card in one of the corners, alright? Watch a review of something I fucking enjoyed reviewing, alright? Watch a review of something I actually like. Do something productive with your time. I mean, come on, you can't honestly want to watch the review of this, right? You're all fucking monsters. The movie opens up with this oil rig, which, in all honesty, is only here to show how big and bad the monster is. These people are literally all here to die. So after witnessing deaths of who knows how many people were on that oil rig, who's up for Mardi Gras? Right, yes, um, uh, quick little side note, has anyone seen the tone? Like, in that brief scene transition, I think we just lost the tone. I think the tone is in a different fucking country right now. We then jump back from Mardi Gras to the best character in this movie. I honestly cannot remember his name, so I have elected to refer to him simply as Admiral Grandpa. That damn thing away. You don't need to watch a YouTube video to know that a 40,000 ton rig doesn't vanish off the Gulf of Mexico. You're worse than my grandchildren. And yes, the most glorious thing about Admiral Grandpa's performance is the fact that he keeps that exact same tone of voice throughout the entire fucking movie. It's just, it's glorious. He keeps that exact tone of voice when he gets 
fucking shot. Apparently Mardi Gras has caused all the military personnel at this facility to be stuck in traffic, save for two NASA scientists, for some reason. And this chap, who for no reason I can understand, is wearing an eye patch. Alright, that was literally the easiest game of spot the secondary antagonist I've ever fucking played. Like, seriously, that wasn't even five minutes. Anyway, we have ourselves a long, drawn-out sequence where four boring people talk to Admiral Grandpa about what's to be done with the missing oil rig. And I keep wondering what happened to it, which is a little pointless because we already know what happened to the rig, and we know there's a giant monster patrolling on the ocean floor. Why are we wasting time on this? And you think this would be the movie, right? That we'd spend the entire runtime dedicated to building up that reveal of when we finally see the giant robots take on the monster. So the entire movie would be sent watching the military try all their typical and usual and experimental weaponry on this monster. But no! Robots turn up literally five minutes later! And who are the pilots, you may ask? Why, they're none other than the Red, Green, and Blue Power Rangers. Come on, they are actively asking for the comparison at this point. I mean, fuck, those jumpsuits look like they came straight out of a Power Rangers spin-off. But no, in all seriousness, the Red Ranger there is literally called Red. And I swear to Christ, Red is having a low-key secret romance with his partner Jimmy. I, it's uncanny, it's unusual, I just don't understand it, but it's there. It's written in the subtext. Like, all throughout the film, when Red and his supposed girlfriend Blue Ranger Tracy are meant to be romantic towards each other, Tracy looks completely uninterested and Jimmy looks like he's heartbroken. And I know it's all used to set up the whole Jimmy and Tracy are knocking boots behind the scenes sort of subplot, the typical thing, but the way Jimmy and Red look at each other sometimes throughout this movie, my head cannon works better. So after the Power Rangers get suited up and get into their Zords, which I have to beat myself to stop asking where the hell these Zords came from, they then begin the slowest descent into the ocean to find out what happened to the oil rig. And when I say it takes forever for them to get to the bottom of the ocean, it takes forever. Like, I swear, it, it feels like it is a fucking 10 minute sequence just watching them plummet to the bottom of the fucking ocean. It is... It just feels like it takes centuries. Like seriously, they even have this fake out sequence where Tracy's bot goes offline for about a minute. Does it feel tense? No, of course it doesn't. Partly because for the scenes they are used, the music doesn't change. It's like a MIDI file played on fucking repeat. So you know, just, just fucking try and stay awake watching this sequence. Try. For the first time watching this movie, actually try to feel invested, engaged care about anything that's happening on screen and stay awake whilst watching it because I fucking bet you you'll be yawning after the first two minutes. Okay pilots, your barometers read you still have another 700 feet to go before you reach the ocean floor. When you do, your system's computer will sync with the ship so you'll have our sonar readings. How are you doing down there, Snug? How's the bug, Admiral? Outstanding. Get down there. Any great ideas on how we're supposed to go looking for this great missing oil rig? They're approaching the ocean floor. Sh shit, what's happening? Uh, fuck. The oh, they're, they're at the bottom, right, yeah. Okay. Take position five. We are then subjected to another painfully boring sequence where the Zords wander the ocean floor looking for the monster in fucking pitch black water. Honestly, this sequence would look better if they taped glow sticks and torches to be actors at this point. And you know, we still have yet to see this fucking monster. Like, could we just get to see the crappy CGI effects punching the snot out of each other yet, please? Oh, you know what would be even better than seeing these robots beat the shit out of a monster? Seeing them chase after a monster that we haven't even seen yet. Can we just see the Jurassic Park knockoffs already? For the love of God, please. Due to the shenanigans, Jimmy and Tracy end up offshore and Red is the only one who's left to fight the monster. I mean, I say he's the only one who can fight the monster, he wasn't really that effective in killing it. Yeah, I mean, seriously, for once, it's a fucking army that kills one of these things. I mean, shit, Red just holds him in place for the military to bomb the Jim Christ out of the monster. Which, you know, begs the question as to why they send these Zords out again in the second half of the fucking movie, because they've clearly been shown they don't fucking do shit. The monster is, of course, only the first, and after a long series of scenes where we are so clearly meant to build a relationship with these characters if they weren't so fucking dull, we finally get a second front of King monster attack. 
And what new improvements have been made to the robots? Why now the pilots can operate the monsters through their movements, of course, through a neural link. Alright, four problems with this. Number one, they clearly had near perfect mobility in these suits to begin with, alright? Number two, you strapped a jetpack to these robots now. How is a neural link meant to help with piloting a jetpack? I mean, we don't have biological jetpacks of our own. How is that meant to translate from robot to person? Number three, they say now that these neural links are activated when a robot are impacted or take damage. That damage is translated back to the pilot, like it's a fucking matrix. But robots don't feel pain. Pain is technically information, I understand that, but that's not how pain works. It's just impact data, it's not physical pain. And number four, look at these cockpit designs. They are clearly designed for a seated pilot, not for full body motion like the ones in Pacific Rim. Fucking think this through, guys! So they end up having to fly over to New York where the monster ends up attacking, and somehow they end up using up almost all of their energy in the first five minutes of the fight. So to conserve energy, what do they do? They get out their anime-inspired melee weaponry. You know what I miss? Pacific Rim. And speaking of anime weaponry, did you see the weapons they used in the trailer for Pacific Rim Uprising? Honestly, I wish this movie came out earlier. It might have saved Yama Del Toro's Hellboy series, but you know, I'm stoked for Pacific Rim Uprising. What do you guys think? Yes, I'm doing whatever I can to avoid talking about this goddamn fucking movie. Leave me alone. So Eye Patch Man from earlier decides that rather than let three giant robots and a giant monster rampage through New York, he's gonna nuke it to shit. Which, you know, that seems like a sensible decision. It works so well in the Avengers. And just like in the Avengers, Red pulls an Iron Man. I mean, seriously, he takes a nuke, shoves it up the monster's butthole, and then pushes them both out into space, miraculously surviving the explosion and the crash back to Earth. The day is saved, Ren and Jimmy have a tearful reunion, Tracy was there I guess, and Admiral Grandpa snaps a selfie for his grandkids. The end. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Atlantic Rim. Fucking Christ, shoot me. I mean honestly, what can I say at this point? I am genuinely running out of ways to say this asylum movie is bad. It's not entertainingly bad like in Sharknado or Bloodstorm. There aren't any standout funny moments like an Avengers Grim. It's just a boring copy and paste job with neither heart, soul, or effort that Pacific Rim had that made it so fucking cool. Atlantic Rim. It's another shitty asylum movie, guys. What can I say? I mean, take it from me. This movie is almost impossible to watch on your own, alright? That's how bad it is. It is just so devoid of anything in it that it's just. One of those films you literally have to enjoy with a group of friends and some strong alcohol. I don't mean a couple of beers, I don't mean like a few alcohol pops, I mean get some hard fucking liquor because you are going to need it to sit through this shit fest. And that is why Atlantic Rim gets a dark rating of 19. Go, go, power Rangers! <sighs> One down, two to go. What do we have next week, I wonder? If you have a suggestion for a future review, please leave it in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed this review. I've been Darkest Anime 101. You have been watching Darkest 101 Reviews. Thanks for watching. Happy fucking nightmares.